story one of the human boy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales the human boy by eden philpotts story one the artfulness of steggles one i remember the very evening he came to maryville nubby tompkins had a cold on his chest so mathers and i stopped in from the half-hour kickabout in the playground before tea being chums of nubby's whenever he gets a cold on the chest he thinks he's going to die and this evening sitting by the fire in the fifth classroom he roasted chestnuts for mathers and me and took a very gloomy view of his future life as you know he said i hate being out of doors excepting when i can lie about in hay and to make me go out walking in all weathers as they do here is simply murder i know what'll be the end of it i shall get bacilluses or microbes into some important part of me and die it's like those books the doctor reads to the kids on sundays with choir boys in them the little brutes sing like angels and their voices go echoing to the top of cathedrals and make people blub about in the pews then they get microbes on the chest and kick you know the only thing i can do is to sing and i shall die as sure as mud nubby was a corker at singing he had all the solos in the chapel to himself and people came miles to hear him you won't die said mathers you don't give your money away to the poor or help blind people across roads and all that your voice'll crack and you'll live oh i wish it would said nobby i would feel a lot safer mine continued mathers cracked when my mustache came we looked at him as he patted it mathers was going next term he had more moustache than at least two of the undermasters and once he let nubby stroke it and nubby said he could feel it distinctly under the hand that's what's done it with him said nubby looking at mathers and opening another gloomy subject mathers got redder and began peeling a chestnut i wish i was as certain as you he said none of us can be certain i said but if your voice did go nubs you'd be out of the hunt for one i am declared nubby last time i had a cold in the throat she sent me a little bunch of grapes by jane and a packet of black currant lozenges but this time though the attack is on my chest and i may die she hasn't sent a thing well perhaps she doesn't know she does i met her going into the library yesterday and i doubled up and barked like a dog and she never even said she was sorry it lies between you two chaps now i believe you are going strongest just at present said mathers critically to me you came off last wednesday and kicked two goals on your own and she said afterwards to brown that she never saw you play a bigger game then that little beast brown i mean sniggered and made that noise in his throat like a sprung bat and said he was quite glad he hadn't kept you in that's how he shows em of what a gulf there is between the fifth and masters the bigger the gulf the better i said it would be rough on a decent worm to put it second to brown in my opinion even a double first would be nothing if he wore salmon-coloured ties and elastic-sided boots and brown isn't a double first by long chalks he can only teach the kids and his desk is well known to be crammed with cribs of every kind in the matter of m i may say at once that she was millie dr denham's youngest daughter twelve and a half fair blue eyes and jolly difficult to please somehow the fifth always drew her most the six were feeble beggars at that time two of the ten wore spectacles and one was going out to africa as a missionary and used to treat the fifth's classroom as a sort of training ground for preaching and doing good he was called fulcher and the spirit was willing in him but the flesh was flabby we used to assegai him with stumps and pretend to scalp him and boil him and eat him he said he should glory in martyrdom really and nubs who knows a good deal about eating used to write recipes for cooking fulcher and post them to imaginary african kings but i should think that to be merely eaten is not martyrdom properly speaking 
if it is then everything we eat down to periwinkles must be martyrs which is absurd like euclid says well it got to be a settled idea at merivale that m cared in a sort of vague way for either nubby or mathers or me or all of us the situation was too uncertain for anything like real jealousy among us besides we were chums and had no objection to going shares in m s regard at football mathers and i fought like demons for merivale and for m s good word but any impression we might make was generally swept away in chapel by nubby when sunday came he could sing mind you it was like cold water down your spine and all from printed music besides he could be ill which gave him a pull over mathers and me who couldn't to look at nubby was nothing he had big limbs but they were soft as sausages if you punched him he didn't bruise yellow and afterwards black but merely turned red and then white again mathers besides being captain of the first footer eleven had nigger hair that girls always go dotty about and black eyes and pretty nearly as much moustache as eyebrow as for me my biceps were the biggest in the lower school which isn't much of course but things like that tell with a girl then it was that conversation turned to steggles he was a new boy due that afternoon hardly had the name passed my lips when the door opened and the doctor's head appeared the next moment a chap followed him ah there are some of the fellows by the fire said the doctor is that you tompkins but i needn't ask yes sir said nubby rising you are ill-advised tompkins to spend the greater part of your leisure sitting as you do almost upon the hob a constitutional weakness is thereby increased this is steggles you will have time for a little conversation before tea the doctor disappeared and steggles came slowly down the room with his hands in his pockets there was nothing to indicate a new boy about him he had red rims to his eyes and a spot or two on his face chiefly near his nose and on his forehead his hair was sandy and he wore a gold watch-chain you're called steggles aren't you said nubby who was an awfully civil chap in his manners i am well i hope you'll like merivale do you all right in summer time when there's hay hate it when i'm ill which i am now what can you do asked mathers in his abrupt way i can draw said steggles what devils do one said mathers he got a piece of cambridge demi and a pen and ink then steggles evidently anxious to please sat down and did as good a devil as ever i saw nubby and i were greatly pleased what else can you do said mathers as if such a power to draw devils wasn't as much as you could expect from one chap well, i can smoke cigarettes so can anybody no a pipe oh where did you learn that at harrow then steggles started like a guilty thing and put his hand over his mouth too late a rumour we had heard was proved true it would have been sure to get out and i don't care who knows it for that matter said steggles defiantly i had to leave there because i didn't know enough and couldn't get up higher in the school i'm rather backward through not being properly taught the teaching at harrow simply's cruel not but what i've taught myself a thing or two mind you i'm fifteen he looked at us out of his red-rimmed eyes and put me in mind of a ferret i've got at home he might have been any age up to twenty i thought can you play anything asked mathers well, the piano mathers shivered and nubby grew excited ah, so can i we'll do duets he said ah, if you like said steggles then the tea-bell rang two whole books might be written about steggles at merivale i heard thompson say after he had been there a week that it wasn't what he didn't know had rendered it necessary for steggles to leave harrow but what he did know certainly he had a great deal of general information about rum things he got newspapers by post concerning sporting matters he knew an immense deal about dogs and horses and nubbs who was a judge said his piano playing surpassed his devil drawing for sheer brilliance yet with all these accomplishments he only managed to get into the fourth as to his smoking it was certainly wonderful and he ate things afterwards to hide the smell 
he had a genius for wriggling out of rows and for getting them up between other fellows he loved to look on at fighting and knew all the proper rules on the whole he was rather a beast and if it hadn't been for nubby mathers and i should have barred him but all i'm going to tell about now is the hideous discovery of steggles and m and the thing that happened on the day of the match with buckland grammar school m had been very queer for a fortnight queer i mean with all three of us which was unusual then seeing how the cat had taken to jumping i tackled her one morning going through the hall to the doctor's study how'd you like steggles i said oh, very well he's clever she said he's fifteen i said he ought to know something if he's ever going to he's only in the fourth anyway you're jealous and so is mathers she said jealous of a chap with ferret eyes not likely i said you are though not more than nubs and mathers anyway i said it's off with the old friends and on with the new i suppose steggles knows how to treat a girl you might learn manners from him and so might the others she said and also the piano perhaps he plays beautifully have you seen him play football no lucky for you football isn't everything no and not since he came i've noticed that this bitter speech stung him and her eyes jolly well flashed sparks nor singing either i went on nubs nearly burst himself last sunday in chapel and all the time you were watching steggles making a rabbit with his pocket handkerchief i'll thank you not to interest yourself in me any more she said either in chapel or out of it all right i dare say i shall still live i said does that remark apply equally to mathers and nubby or only to me to mathers yes she said he's as bad as you are not to nubs then she went well there it stood when i told them mathers seemed to think i needn't have dragged him in and nubs got clean above himself with hope not seeing that he was really just as much out of it as us of course we chucked steggles for good and all then and told him what we thought of him that was when he said something about only the brave deserving the fair and mathers made him sit down in a puddle for cheeking him in the playground steggles eyes looked like one of his own devils while he sat there but he took it jolly quietly at the time that got nubby's wool off though because he supported steggles and things were in fact rather difficult all round till the day of the buckland grammar school match buckland was two miles from merivale and most of the team went by train but mathers and i the day being fine decided to walk and at the last moment nubs asked if he might come with steggles out of consideration for nubby we agreed and the four of us started on a fine bright afternoon just after dinner mathers and i had our football things on of course nubs was dressed in his usual style and steggles who used to get himself up tremendously on half holidays wore yellow spats over his boots and a sort of white thing under his waistcoat and gloves we had rather more than half an hour's walk before us and hardly were we out of sight of merivale when steggles pulled out his pipe and lighted it three the artfulness of steggles properly begins here he knew several things we didn't he knew for instance that m was coming to the football match that she was going to ride her bicycle over on the road by which we walked that only the day before he had quarrelled with her and that his position with regard to her was at that hour most risky all these things steggles well knew and we didn't so he lighted his pipe with an air of long practice the smell was fine and he smacked his lips now and then nice pouch he said handing me a velveteen pouch with his initials on it in green silk i'll bet a girl did that said mathers ah, it's a secret said steggles smiling to himself then he asked very civilly if we would care to join him explaining that he generally kept a few spare pipes about him for friends i would if it wasn't for the match said mathers so would i i said well my backy might turn you fellows up perhaps you are wise declared steggles puffing away 
then he tried nubby with a little cherrywood pipe and nubs thought a whiff or two wouldn't hurt him and began rather nervously but gathered courage as he went on i heard my father say once that life without tobacco would be hell said steggles and i agree with him so do i it's very soothing said nubby then mathers burst out he had been sulking ever since steggles hinted that the contents of his velveteen pouch were too strong for us if you think i funk your tobacco you're wrong mathers said i've smoked three parts of a cigar before to-day a chocolate one perhaps said steggles but in such a humble inquiring voice that mathers couldn't hit him no a tobacco one and if you've got another pipe i'll show you so will i i chimed in mathers lead was always good enough for me steggles immediately lugged out two more pipes he seemed to be stuffed with them get it well alight at the start he explained handing a fusee all right all right i know said mathers soon we were at it like four chimneys and steggles praised us in such a way that we could take no offence you've all smoked many a time and oft i can see that he said mathers spat about a good deal and fancied tobacco was probably a fine steadier for the nerves before a football match and nubbs said he thought so too and he also thought that after a little smoking one didn't want to talk but ought just to keep quiet and think of interesting things it widens the mind said steggles we tramped on rather silently for ten minutes till nubbs spoke again to our surprise his hopeful tone had changed and we found he had turned a sort of putty colour with blue lips he said i'll um overtake you fellows I, I think i've got i've got a bit of a sunstroke or something it, it'll pass off no doubt better not smoke any more said steggles oh it isn't that but i won't all the same i'll just dodge through that hole in the hedge and find some wild strawberries or hazelnuts or something seeing it was a frosty day in december nubby's statements looked wild but he went there was a hole in the hedge with tree roots trailing across it and nubs crawled shakily through like a wounded rabbit into a place where a board was stuck up saying that people would be prosecuted according to law if they went there but he didn't seem to care though it wasn't a thing he would have done in cold blood i saw mathers grow uneasy in his mind wasn't the pipe eh huh? oh no no this tobacco why a child could smoke it said steggles you know what nubs is it's only an excuse to turn he hates football and hates walking we kept on again and i began to feel a slight perspiration on my forehead and a weird sort of feeling everywhere i had smoked about half the pipe well, i shan't go on with this now because of the match i said hastily knocking out the remaining tobacco and handing his loathsome little clay back to steggles why he said blessed if you haven't gone the same colour as nubs did don't say you've got a sunstroke too there was something in the voice of steggles i didn't much like but i hardly felt equal to answering him then you're all right anyway aren't you mathers he asked course i am what the dickens do you mean oh, nothing glad you like my backy there's plenty of time for another pipe no there isn't said mathers i very much wish there was we walked on a few yards farther do you drink that rich brown cod liver oil the same as nubby asked steggles of mathers suddenly mathers looked at him and i knew how things were in a moment for a moment my own sufferings were forgotten before the awful spectacle of the ruin of mathers he gave his pipe back quietly took great gasps of air mopped his forehead and rolled his eyes about then he said i'm not quite happy about nubs you push on and i'll overtake you hanged if you're not queer too exclaimed steggles whoever would have thought that three castles shut up said mathers hoarsely it was the boy boiled beef at dinner he spoke the words with an awful effort well, so it was i said feebly we never could stand it either of us a steaming glass of hot grog is what you want said steggles sympathetically go gasped mathers who really looked horrid now go or i'll kick you if it kills me to do it blessed if you haven't turned green mathers said steggles you look as if you've been buried and dug up again i don't say it unkindly but it's jolly curious 
at the same moment ting ting went a bicycle bell and there was milly looking fine you'll all be late she said we prayed she would hurry on and not observe us too narrowly then that beast steggles made her stop look here he said it's frightfully serious because of the match these poor chaps are ill just cast your eye at the colours they've gone they worried me to let em dry to smoke and i'll break your neck for this interrupted mathers then he turned to em if you're a lady if you ever cared an atom about us please ride on round that corner we're ill can't you see it oh yes i can anybody could i'm sorry but you won't hurt steggles if i go said em no i promise say we're on the road and shall be there in ten ten go em took the hint and rode off with steggles frisking beside her like the dog he was thank the lord said mathers then horrid things happened both to him and me we crawled to the match more dead than alive and found a crowd waiting and brown and several of the other masters we were fully twenty minutes late this is very unsportsmanlike the day being so short too brown squeaked then we took off our coats and tottered into the field of play of course buckland grammar school won our side would have done a long way better without us i couldn't take a pass or shoot for the life of me it occupied all my time wrestling with nature let alone the bucklanders and mathers who played back was worse the roughs guyed him and asked him what he'd been drinking if they'd asked him what he'd been smoking there might have been some sense in it he told me afterwards that he often saw three footballs at one time when he tried to kick and sometimes four and the ball he kicked always turned out to be an apparition bradwell kept goal grandly too but it was no good with mathers like that and he utterly ruined ashby major the other back nubs had gone to bed when we got back and the matron knowing nubs had a tricky system sent for dr barnes nubs therefore gave himself away m never looked at any of us again and she and steggles undoubtedly became frightful pals but the next term just before easter i had the pleasure of writing a fine letter to mathers who had left merivale and was reading for six months with a private tutor before going to cambridge this is part of the letter dear mathers i wrote you will be interested to know that brown has come down on steggles at last i fancy brown knew the doctor was fairly sick of steggles and wanted to be rid of him in fact i heard the doctor call steggles a cankerworm myself anyway brown blew up on the smoking and steggles will soon probably vanish like the dew upon the fleece m cried a bit i fancy when she heard of it but nubs says she smiled at him two mornings afterwards coming out of chapel nubs expects to crack his voice any day but he hopes to get a definite understanding with m before it happens it'll be too late after of course she never looks at me she told steggles and he told me that she could not possibly care for a person she had once seen the hue of a liberty art fabric meaning me i scragged steggles after he told me but it is all over now i believe he is to go into his father's business steggles and stoat wine merchants m is more beautiful than ever though i'm afraid she's got a bad disposition to reflect on a fellow's colour at such a time as that was a bit rough End of story one story two of the human boy by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story two the protest of the wing dormitory one this is the story of the most tremendous thing that ever happened in dunston's or any other school i should think though in it luckily i didn't do any of the big part being merely one of those chaps who were flogged and not expelled afterwards trelawney and bradwell carried the thing through and all the other fellows in the wing dormitory followed their lead and mind you everybody had the welfare of the school at heart it seemed a jolly brave sort of thing to do and jolly interesting 
trelawney arranged the military side of the business and bradwell whose father is known as the whiteley of some place in yorkshire looked to the commissariat which means feeding as to trelawney who really captained the dormitory he was cornish and a relation of that very chap fifty thousand cornishmen wanted to know the reason why about long ago he was going to be a soldier read history books for choice and already knew many military words i was bradwell's fag at the time because watson minor had failed in some secret enterprise and i remember the first conversation which led to everything happening to take some tuck in to bradwell in the fifth classroom i found trelawney there and heard him say the only way a protest and a jolly dignified one must be made it's for the credit of the school and if the doctor will not see it we must show him i've thought about it a lot and i think if a section of chaps could put themselves in a strong fortified position they might demand to be heard and even be able to offer an uh, uh, ultimatum of course doing the thing for the good of the school and not for ourselves makes us morally right oh of course said bradwell but we must be physically strong in warfare the relative positions of the sides are always taken into account when the treaties of peace are arranged what are you staring at said bradwell to me you hook it so i hooked but i knew perfectly well what they were talking about everybody in the wing dormitory did because they often discussed the same question after they thought the rest of the chaps were asleep it was the new mathematical master thompson who troubled not only trelawney and bradwell but a lot of the other fellows trelawney had called him an unholy bounder the third day he was there and that seemed to be a general opinion yet with all his bounderlishness he was awfully clever and meant well but he didn't know anything about chaps in a general way and he left out his h's and stuck them in with awfully rum effects thompson tried hard to be friendly to everybody but only the kids liked him he couldn't understand somehow and insulted chaps in the most frightful way not seeing any difference between fellows at the top of the school and mere kids at the bottom captains of elevens were as nothing to him he seemed to have read up boys like he read mathematics and stuff from rotten books he would say sometimes now you fellows let's have a jolly game a leapfrog before a bell rings and things like that boys never do play leapfrog except in books really once he offered to show trelawney how to make a kite and he asked chambers chambers mind you the captain of the first eleven at cricket whether he knew a shop where there were capital iron hoops for sale at a shilling each i heard him say it and he put it like this i say chambers do you know those splendid hoops they sell at burford's in high street it's out of bounds but if you like i'll get you one this evening they've got iron crooks and everything i make this offer because you understood a little of what i said about conic sections this afternoon thompson meant so jolly well that nobody could get in a wax with him personally and as i say the kids who didn't see the unholy bounder side of him and only knew he stood gallons of ginger beer on half holidays in the playing fields liked him better than anybody but trelawney took big views and so did bradwell and they decided to make a definite protest nothing happened till one day thompson said something about trelawney's celtic thickness of skull that stung trelawney like nettles and he set to work and arranged the great plot of the wing dormitory he decided that the fifteen chaps who slept in the isolated wing dormitory of dunstan's were to fortify the place and hold it before the world and the doctor as a protest against thompson every chap in the dormitory from trelawney and bradwell to watson minor signed their names in their own blood on a paper trelawney drew out and watson minor fainted while he was doing it not being able to see his own gore on a pen without going off we swore by a tremendous swear to obey trelawney to fortify the wing dormitory against siege to devote every penny of our week's pocket money to provisions and to hold out till we starved having first signed another paper for dr dunstan explaining our united protest against thompson and hoping for the good of the school that he would be removed 
i didn't understand much about it really in fact i don't believe anybody did but trelawney and bradwell only they said we were acting for the good of the school and they also said that if we held the wing dormitory properly nothing short of cannon or starvation could dislodge us it was a tremendously tall building complete in itself with iron fireproof doors constructed to cut it off from the rest of the school and with a bathroom and a lavatory adjoining all at a great height above the ground the windows were barred to keep chaps getting out the bars would also keep chaps getting in as trelawney pointed out he found also that it was possible when the iron doors were closed to pull down some woodwork and stick things behind the doors so as they could not be opened again the only entrance to the wing dormitory was through these iron doors so once shut we were safe against anything but gunpowder and trelawney said dr dunstan was not the man to resort to physical means especially if it meant knocking the place about bradwell came out wonderfully about the food and knowing jolly well that they would turn the water out of the bathroom when the siege started he made every chap fill his basin and jug the night before because fresh water is vital to a siege there were fifteen chaps and the time came at last and one night we laid the manifesto on the mat outside the iron door made everything fast and waited to see what would happen some fellows thought that thompson would be sent away at once to avoid the affair becoming serious others fancied we should be starved out or expelled to a man trelawney never hazarded any guess at what would be the end of it we are doing our duty in the interests of the school he said and whatever happens we mean well and if it gets into print the sympathy of all chaps in public schools will be on our side two when the gas was turned out at the meter on the night preceding the siege trelawney made a short speech first he lighted two candles and made us sign the protest then he explained his military system of night and day watches and guards each of the four windows had a guard at all hours and two chaps were to be stationed at the iron door this was made doubly strong by beds piled against it after the manifesto had been finally signed and left outside the document ran thus we the undersigned thinking that the fame of dunstan's is tarnished by mr thompson m a fellow of trinity college cambridge hereby protest and formally assert themselves to call attention to mr thompson we the undersigned have no personal grudge to mr thompson but think him unsuited to carry on the great reputation of dunstan's we the undersigned take this important step fully alive to the gravity of it for we are prepared to suffer if necessary to call attention to the subject we do not doubt mr thompson's goodness and wish it to be understood that the action is abstract and not personal a string will be lowered from the third window of the wing dormitory to-morrow at eight thirty a m any answer to the protest will receive instant attention from us the undersigned and then followed the names of course it was all greek to the kids but they put their trust in trelawney and signed to a kid inside the dormitory we were jolly busy too because after trelawney as commander had made his rules and regulations clear bradwell as the head of the commissariat drew up a list of the total supplies and showed what each fellow had contributed to the store this list i copied for bradwell at the time with notes about the different supplies it comes in here and i must give it just to show what different ideas different chaps have about the things you ought to eat in a siege trelawney two hams eight loaves of bread bradwell three tens potted salmon two seed cakes big box of biscuits ashby major ten ten sardines ashby has five shillings a week pocket money his father being rather rich bradwell said it was rather a pity he spent it all on sardines ashby minor three pats of butter three ten swiss milk one ten guava jelly bradwell was awfully pleased about the milk because he said it was at once nourishing and pleasant to the taste wilson six dried herrings two pots of veal and ham paste one pot marmalade herrings useless unless eaten raw west four bottles of raspberry vinegar 
i am west and i thought raspberry vinegar would be a jolly good thing to break the monotony of a siege but bradwell said it was simply a luxury morant one hamper containing twenty-four apples twenty-seven pears two pots of blackberry jam morant has no pocket money but bradwell said the fruit was good for a change gideon nothing gideon is a jew by birth and gets ten shillings a week pocket money he pretended he had forgotten trelawney says he will suffer for it in the course of the siege mathers eight pieces of shortbread five slabs of toffee seven sausage rolls the rolls were cut in half to be eaten first thing before they went bad but bradwell said mathers had made the selection of a fool and so mathers was rather vexed with bradwell nunes ten loaves five brown one packet of beef tabloids trelawney congratulated nunes mckins a lot of spring onions and lettuces costing one and sixpence mckins had been reading a book about chaps getting scurvy on a raft and he thought a siege would be just the place for scurvy so he bought all green stuff and bradwell said it was good corky minimus three pounds of mixed sweets bradwell smacked his head when he heard what corgi minimus had got but trelawney pointed out that a few sweets served out from time to time might distract the mind derbyshire a pigeon pie and thirteen currant buns with saffron on them forest four pots bovril one bottle cider bovril can be taken on bread like treacle and once saved the lives of several shipwrecked sailors watson minor two pounds dog biscuits one pound dried figs one box of dates asked why he took dog biscuits he explained it was because he had seen an advertisement about the goodness of them it said they had dried buffalo meat in them which was a thing you could live for an immense duration of time on trelawney said that it was pretty fair sense for a kid all this splendid food was brought out of boxes where it had been hidden and placed in the hands of bradwell and that night he sat up with a candle and drew out bills of fare and made calculations we were rather surprised in the morning to hear the rations would not last more than a fortnight but trelawney said the siege must be over long before that nobody slept much and many had dressed before the first bell rang when the second bell rang trelawney and bradwell went to the door to listen presently thompson of all people came up and tried to get in and couldn't he shook the door then saw the envelope addressed to the doctor and said what's the meaning of this you fellows let me in at once but nobody answered then he cleared off at eight thirty the string was lowered from the window and trelawney went and stood by it to pull up any letter that might be fastened to it but none was some of the chaps were prowling about outside looking at the wing dormitory but trelawney wouldn't let anybody go to the windows except himself then as nothing happened we had breakfast mackenzie and forrest were told off to help bradwell and each chap's rations were put on his bed after he made it we all got the same except gideon a slice of bread two sardines half one of mather's sausage rolls and half a tumbler of water so we began at once to see what a jolly serious thing a siege is and gideon saw it more than we did because he had no sardines and no sausage roll he offered trelawney money for a little more food but trelawney said he shouldn't have as much as one mixed sweet though he might pay gold for it he said you will have barely enough to keep you alive and gideon turned awfully white when he heard it breakfast didn't take more than about five minutes then there was a tremendous knocking at the iron door and bradwell said the trouble had begun but trelawney said it was the summons to a parley anyway we heard the doctor's voice and it wasn't much of a parley strictly speaking because he spoke first and merely gave us two minutes to be in our places downstairs if you don't obey one and all of you said the doctor you must take the consequences as it is they will be sufficiently grave any further offence i shall know how to treat if you please sir said trelawney the string is out of the window we are doing this for the good of the school and then he stopped because he had heard the doctor go away he'll try a blacksmith first said forrest then when they find they can't do anything with his iron door he'll send for policemen 
but nothing was done strangely enough and trelawny made the chaps lie down and sleep if they could in the afternoon because he expected a night attack with ladders to get in it would be necessary to remove the bars from the windows and anybody attempting to do so would of course be at our mercy with the windows open for dinner that day we had one of trelawny's hams cut into fifteen pieces with two rather thin slices of bread one spring onion and three mixed sweets each and as much raspberry vinegar as would go into a bullet mould that wilson had gideon ate the ham like anybody else which shows jews don't refuse pork in any shape at times of siege whatever they say trelawny wouldn't give him any raspberry vinegar but ashby minor let him have one of his mixed sweets which was green and had arsenic in it ashby minor thought it seemed a frightfully long day and nothing being done against us made it longer bradwell tried to cook wilson's herrings with stuff out of a pillowcase but unfortunately failed trelawny explained that dunston was working out tactics and would do something when the moon rose he said our motto was to be defence not defiance but derbyshire said they were going to starve us out like rats so as to reduce the glory as much as possible one or two chaps had private rows that day and trelawny was pretty short and sharp he said we were to regard ourselves as under martial law and he stopped forrest having any tea at all because he looked out of the window and waved his hand to steggles in the playground what made it worse for forrest was that we opened one of his pots of bovril at that very tea and of course he didn't have any but trelawny said it was good discipline and wouldn't let mathers divide his share with young forrest though he wanted to the day dragged out nothing was done and no letter was put on the string then night came and moonlight and trelawny set watches at each window and door with directions to wake him instantly if anything happened or anybody assembled outside below but he didn't sleep really in fact only a few of the kids did bradwell got a bit down in the mouth after dark and i heard him say to trelawny it wasn't turning out like he thought and trelawny said it's always the same when a position is impregnable i could show you a dozen similar sieges in history of course it's the most uninteresting sort of siege when chaps simply sit and see the enemy get to the end of their food supplies but they won't do that with us the day boys will talk and old dunston will raise heaven and earth to keep it out of the printed papers i bet he'll tie something to the string to-morrow some of us tried to take a bright view like trelawny but when we heard him tell bradwell to run no risks and serve out as little bread as possible we felt that he did not really feel as hopeful of a short siege as he seemed just before dusk corky minimus was caught in the act of flinging a letter out of the window addressed to his mother it was torn up and he was cautioned that ended the day and nothing else happened until a quarter to one o'clock then bradwell whose watch it was called cave and came to trelawny with frightful excitement to say that there was the head of a ladder at his window and a man climbing up trelawny was there in a second and asked in a loud voice what the man wanted and said he'd throw the ladder down if the man came up another rung but the man said hush you silly fellow i'm a friend with news from the enemy the least you can do is to hear what i've got to say good lord said trelawny it's thompson and so it was and his huge head soon got level with the window and looked like a bull's against the moonlight trelawny made everybody get out of earshot except bradwell but he didn't happen to see me being rolled up in bed near the window so i heard first thompson said no here you cornish boy i'm sorry to find we haven't at it off by any means and you want me to go and you've locked yourself and friends up here as a protest now how have i hurt your feelings and what have i done which was a bit difficult for trelawny but he fell back on the manifesto to the doctor it's no personal matter sir we wish to be understood that the action is abstract oh well i can't say i know what the devil you mean by that but i like you all better than ever and i understand this much that you don't like me i'm not proud i'm quite as ready to learn as to teach tell me what makes you do this you queer things 
we don't think you are the right man for dunston sir said trelawney firmly well but isn't dr dunston the best judge his experience reaches back rather farther than yours anyway i'm not going you'll have to tolerate me you'll have to like me too i've disobeyed all orders by climbing up here now to advise you to give in to-morrow take my advice and come out at the first bell and with ropes round your necks measures are in hand and as your protest has utterly failed the sooner you give in and take your punishment the better i've done my best to make it as light as i can but boys mustn't do this sort of thing in big schools you know it's very naughty indeed we shall keep up the protest for another day at least sir said trelawney with a lot of side in his voice no my lad you won't answered thompson the doctor has taken my advice and by very simple means with the least possible waste of time trouble and money we shall enter your stronghold to-morrow i am quite good-tempered to-day to-morrow i shall probably be quite cross and ought the matter is in my hands do be good boys and yield while there is time the sooner the better i regret we cannot comply with your terms sir said trelawney i'm not offering any answered mr thompson i only want to make your foolishness fall as light as possible your mother's and father's arts will ache over this headstrong business the parley is ended said trelawney all right said mr thompson i'm afraid you're a hawful little prig trelawney then he went down the ladder and looking out bradwell reported that he saw him taking it back to the gardener's shed in the shrubbery three there is not much more to be said about the protest of the wing dormitory i suppose thompson was better up in tactics really than trelawney anyway he found a weak spot that trelawney never thought of and he ended the siege by half-past seven the following morning about six ashby major whose watch it was reported that the school fire escape was coming round the corner with it appeared mr thompson mr mannering who is an oxford blue and not much smaller than mr thompson the doctor the gardener and the military agent who drills our volunteer corps and teaches gymnastics they put the escape against the wall of the wing dormitory between two windows where it couldn't be reached by us then thompson and mannering went up and the sergeant and gardener followed the doctor waited at the foot of the ladder they'll get through the roof said trelawney i never thought of that trelawney turned awfully rum in the face and tried to think out a way of repelling a roof attack but there wasn't time in about ten minutes or so the end of an iron bar came through the ceiling then followed a regular avalanche of plaster and dust that fell on wilson minor and jolly nearly smothered him then came thompson mannering followed and the gardener and the sergeant dropped after them as quick as lightning of course we were done because only half of us were fighters the rest being kids and trelawney himself being just fifteen and bradwell fourteen and ashby major twelve and a half and i only eleven and a half it was no good we surrender said trelawney surrender you little brute i should think you did yield said mannering who had cut his hand getting the slates off the roof and was in a rare bait you needn't insult a defeated force sir said trelawney keeping his nerve jolly well we are prepared to pay the penalty of failure and having meant well we we don't care but whether we meant well or not i know trelawney and bradwell both got expelled though thompson was said to have tried very hard for them dunston didn't seem to realize what frightfully good motives prompted them to protest against thompson in an abstract way nothing was done to anybody else except ashby major and me and wilson we were flogged by mr mannering for the doctor and he did it as you might expect from a blue as for thompson he stayed on and the protest never got into print and there wasn't much disgrace for trelawney or bradwell after all because the first afterwards got into woolwich ten from the top through an army crammers and the second joined his father who was the whiteley of the north i spoke of he wrote to me only a week ago to say that he was getting a hundred pounds a year from his governor for doing much less than he had to do at dunston's 
mind you thompson is a jolly good sort really and we know it now and as i heard my uncle say of somebody else i don't suppose it's a matter of life and death whether or no a chap puts his h's in the wrong places if his heart's in the right one end of story two story three of the human boy by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story three freckles and frenchy he was the most peculiar chap that ever came to merivale not excepting even mason who shot the doctor's wife's parrot with a catapult and after he had been flogged offered to stuff it in the face of the whole school and nearly got expelled freckles was so called owing to his skin which was simply a complicated pattern much like what you can see in any map of the grecian archipelago this arose he thought from his having been born in australia anyway it was rum to see and so were his hands which had reddish down on the backs his eyes were also reddish a sort of mixture of red and grey specks and they glimmered like a cat's when he was angry which was often his real name was maine and he had no side his father had made a big fortune selling wool at sydney and his grandfather was one of the last people to be transported to botany bay through no fault of his own after he had been on a convict ship five years a chap at home confessed on his deathbed that he had done the thing maine's grandfather was transported for so they naturally let maine's grandfather go free and he was so much annoyed about it that he never came back home again but married a farmer's daughter near sydney and settled out there for good maine didn't think great things of england and was always talking about the australian forests of blue gum trees and bush and sneering rather at the size of our forests around merivale though they were good ones he never joined in games but roamed away alone for miles and miles into the country on half holidays and trespassed with a cheek i never saw equalled he could run like a hare especially about half a mile or so which as he explained to me is just about a distance to blow a keeper certainly though often chased he was never caught and never recognized owing to things he did which he had learned in australia and copied from famous bushrangers his great hope some day was to be a bushranger himself and he practised in a quiet way every saturday afternoon making it a rule to go out of bounds always his get-up was fine my name is tomkins called nubby because i happen to have a rather large sort of nose and being fond of the country and not keen on games maine rather took to me and after i had sworn on crossed knives not to say a word to a soul which i never did till freckles left he told me his secrets and showed me his things if you've seen freckles starting for an excursion you wouldn't have said there was anything remarkable about him but really he was armed to the teeth and had everything a bushranger would be likely to want in a quiet place like merivale down his leg was the barrel of an air-gun strong enough to kill any small thing like a cat at twenty-five yards the rest of the gun was arranged inside the lining of his coat and the slugs it fired he carried loose in his trousers pockets round his waist he had a leather belt he got from a sailor for a pound inside the leather was human skin said to be flayed off a chap by cannibal somewhere which was a splendid thing to have for your own if it was true and in the belt a place had been specially made for a knife freckles of course had a knife in it a buoy knife that made you cold to see he never used it but kept it ready and said if a keeper ever caught him he possibly might have to in addition to these things he carried in his coat pockets a little spirit lamp and a collapsible tin pot and a bag of tea he said tea was the very life of men in the bush and that often after a hard escape when he was out of danger he would get away behind a woodstack or under banks of a stream or some such secret place and brew a cup and drink it and feel the better for it lastly freckles had a flat lead mask with holes for the eyes and mouth which he always fitted on when trespassing he said it was copied from the helmet ned kelly the king of the bush rangers used to wear but it was not bullet-proof but only used for a disguise 
we were in the same dormitory and one night when all the chaps had gone to sleep he dressed up in these things and stood where some moonlight came in and certainly looked jolly once as an awful favor me being smaller than him and not fast enough to run away from a man he let me come and see what he did when bush ranging on a half holiday in winter i shan't run my usual frightful risks with you he said because i might have to open fire to save you and that would be very disagreeable to me but i'll trespass a bit and i'll shoot a few things if i can i don't shoot much only for food he made me a mask with tinfoil off chocolate smoothed out and gummed on cardboard but i had no weapons and he said i had better not try and get any we started for the usual walk chaps were allowed to go through a public pine wood to merivale but half through by a place where was a board which warned us to keep the path freckles branched off into some dead bracken and squatted down and put on his mask i also put on mine then he fastened his air-gun together and loaded it and told me to walk six paces behind him and do as he did his eyes were awfully keen and now and then he pointed to a feather on the ground or an old nest or a patch of rum fungus or a crab-apple still hanging on the tree though all the leaves were off once he fired at a jay and missed it then fell down in the fern as if he was shot himself and remained quite motionless for some time he told me that he always did so after firing that he might hear if any one had been attracted by the sound it was a well-known bushman's dodge once we saw a keeper through a clearing and freckles lay flat on his stomach and so did i he knew the keeper well and told me that he had many times escaped from him we waited half an hour and turned to go a different way from that of the keeper then where a glade sloped down to some water and the grass was all dewy and covered with mole hills freckles went to inspect a trap he had set a week before he was collecting skins for a moleskin waistcoat but he said skinning moles was one of the beastliest tasks a hunter ever had however there was a mole caught and he skinned it and wrapped up the skin in leaves and put it in his hat then we had some real sport for on the other side of the glade we saw rabbits lopping about and freckles stalked them through the fern while i waited motionless and finally he shot a young one i wanted to take it back and get cook to do it for us but he said i was a fool if you want any you must have it now it's about the time i take a meal he said and that's a part of my ranging and hunting you haven't seen yet he knew the country well and said we were in one of the most carefully preserved places anywhere about which must have been true for there were an awful lot of pheasants calling in the glades but freckles got down into a drain and showed me a hollow he had scooped out under a lot of ivy where it fell over a bank this is one of my caves he said and here we can feed and drink in safety but you mustn't talk or i shan't be able to hear if anything is stirring in the woods he took off his mask set down his gun and lighted his spirit stove skin the rabbit and cut off his hind legs while i make tea he said so i did and he held them over the lamp till they were slightly cooked outside but not right through he ate and drank with his ears straining for every sound then he took the rest of the rabbit and removed all traces of eating and buried everything we had left if i didn't he explained some keeper's dog would find my lair and make a row and give it away and the keepers would doubtless lie in wait for me and catch me red-handed you can't be too careful because every man's hand against you which of course is the beauty of it we got back without anything happening and i've hated the sight of rabbit pretty well ever since but freckles said the juices of animals are better for the human frame underdone well that gives you an idea of freckles and the affair with frenchy which i'm going to tell you about showed that he really was cut out for bush ranging frenchy as we called him was monsieur michel he didn't belong entirely to dunston's but lived in merivale and came to us three days a week and went to a girls school the other three he was a rum oldish chap whose great peculiarities were to make puns in english and to appeal to our honour about everything he would slang a fellow horribly one day and wave his arms and pretty nearly jump out of his skin and the next day he would bring up a whacking pear for the fellow he'd slanged or a new knife or something 
he pretty nearly cried sometimes and he told us his nerves were frightfully tricky and often led him to be harsh when he didn't mean it he couldn't keep order or make chaps work if they didn't choose and Streggles, who had an awfully cunning dodge of always rubbing him up the wrong way and then looking crushed and broken-hearted so as to get things which he did said that frenchy was like a damp fireworks because you never knew exactly when he'd go off or how one day dashing out of class with a frightful yell freckles got sent for and went back and found monsieur raving mad it seemed that freckles had yelled too soon before he was out of the classroom in fact and frenchy had got palpitation of the heart from it he led into freckles properly then he said he was his bete noir and un sort a vingt quatre carats which means an eighteen carat ass in english but twenty four carats in french and one of the aborigines who ought to be kept on a chain and many other such like things freckles turned all colours and then white with a sort of bluish tint to his lips he didn't say a word but looked at frenchy with such a frightful expression that i felt something would happen later all that happened at the time was that freckles got the eighth book of telemachus to write out into french from english and then correct by fenelon which was a pretty big job if a chap had been fool enough to try and do it and m Michel went off to merivale with a big card on his coat-tail with ici on parle francais written upon it in red pencil this i had managed to do myself while frenchy was jawing freckles i told freckles but it didn't comfort him much he said there were some things no mortal chap could stand and to be called an aborigine because a man was born in australia seemed to him about the bitterest insult even an old frog-eating frenchman could have invented happening to him of all chaps it was especially a thing which would have to be revenged seeing what his views were he said i couldn't bush range or anything with a clear conscience in the future if i had a thing like this hanging over me unrevenged it's the frightfulest slur on my character and i won't sit down under it for fifty frenchmen then he said he should take a week to settle what to do and went into the playground alone next time a frenchy came up he was just the same as ever awfully easy-going and jolly and let freckles off the telemachus and offered him as classy a knife with a corkscrew and other things including tweezers as ever you saw just the knife for freckles considering his ways but it didn't come off freckles got white again when he saw the knife and said thank you monsieur i don't want your knife and the imposition is half done and will be finished next time you come then frenchy called him a silly boy and tried to make a joke and pinch freckles by the ear but nobody saw the joke and freckles dodged away then frenchy sighed and looked round to see who should have the knife and didn't seem to see anybody in particular and left it on his desk he often sighed in class and sometimes told us he was without friends unless he might call us friends and we said he might when he went freckles told me he considered the knife was another insult then he explained what he was going to do he said i shall finish the impot first so as not to be obliged to him for anything and then i shall stick him up stick him up how i said it's a bush-ranging expression he explained to stick up a man is to make him stand and deliver what he's got i see my way to do this with frenchy he always goes and comes from merivale through the woods as you know and now he's up here on friday nights coaching slade and betterton for their army exam afterwards he has supper with mr thompson or the doctor there you are i wait my time in the wood which is jolly lonely by night though it is such a potty little place hardly worth calling a wood then he comes along and i stick him up it's highway robbery i said you might get years and years of imprisonment oh i might he said but i shan't you must begin your career some time and i'm going to next friday night i've often got out of the dormitory and been in that wood by night and only the chaps in the dormitory have known it well the night came and all that we heard about it till afterwards was that about eleven o'clock or possibly even later than that there was a fearful peeling at the front door of dunston's and looking out we could see a stretcher and something on it 
that something was actually freckles though the few chaps who knew what was going to be done felt sure it must be frenchy because freckles is five feet ten and growing and frenchy isn't more than five feet six at the outside and a poor thing at that but it was freckles all right and two laboring men had brought him back and frenchy had come with them not until five weeks afterwards when freckles could get up and limp about did i hear the truth and i'll tell it in his own words because they must be better than a chap's who wasn't there he seemed frightfully down in the mouth and said that he could never look fellows in the eyes again but it cheered him telling me and when i told him he was thundering well out of it he admitted he was he said well, i got off all right and the moon was as clear as day and everything just ripe for sticking a chap up then like a fool having a longish time to wait i didn't simply stop in shadow behind a tree trunk or something in the usual way but thought i'd do a thing i'd never heard of bushrangers doing though indian thugs are pretty good at it i went and got up a tree which has a branch over the road and thought i'd drop down almost on top of frenchy to start with and that's just what i did do only i dropped wrong and came down pretty nearly on my head owing to slipping somehow at the start what did exactly happen to me as i left the tree i never shall know anyway frenchy came along sure enough and i dropped and he jumped i should think fully a yard in the air but that was all because in falling i hit a big root it was a beech tree and went and broke something in my ankle and something in my chest and couldn't stand consequently of course i couldn't stick him up the pain was pretty fair but feeling what a fool i was seemed to make me forget it anyway finding it was useless to think of sticking him up i tried to hobble into the fern and get out of sight and finding i could not crawl i rolled but of course you can't roll away from a chap and he came after me and my mask fell off while i rolled and he recognized me mon dieu it is the boy main he said speak child what in the wide world was this i disguised my voice and said i wasn't main and that he'd better leave me alone or it might be the worse for him yet but he wouldn't go and chancing to get queer about the head somehow i went off i suppose though it wasn't for long when i came to he was gone but he rushed back in a minute with that rotten old top hat he wears full of water he'd got from the puddle in the stone pit he doused my head and made me sit up with my back against a tree then feeling the frightfulness of it i begged him to clear out and let me alone i said you don't know what you're doing i'm no friend to you but the deadliest enemy you've got in the world and if i hadn't fallen down at a critical moment and broken myself i should have stuck you up monsieur michel so now you know he said to himself the poor mad boy the poor mad boy i will run a toute jambe for succor but i told him not to i began to get a rum hot pain in my side then but i felt i would gladly have died there rather than be obliged to him i said you called me an aborigine which is the most terrible thing you can call an australian-born chap and you wanted to pass it off with a knife with a corkscrew and tweezers in it but you couldn't expect me to take it feeling as i did now the fortunes of war have given you the victory and if you please i wish you'd go but he refused he said he wouldn't have hurt my feelings for anything he seemed to overlook altogether what i was going to do to him and asked me where it hurt me i told him and he said it was his fault fancy that and wished he was big enough to carry me back i kept on asking him to go and at last after begging my pardon like anything for about a week it seemed he went but i heard him shouting and yelling french yells in the woods and after a bit he came back with two men and a hurdle they presently took me back and what frenchy said since to the doctor i don't know in fact i didn't know anything for days anyway i've had nothing but a mild rowing and a very good grub and i'm not to be even flogged though that's probably because i broke a rib or two not including the bone in my leg but i'm all right now and i think it was about the most sporting thing a chap ever did for frenchy to treat me like that hm i shouldn't have thought it was in a frenchman to do it especially after i told him what i was going to do oh, yes i said that's all right but what about bush ranging it's pretty sickening he said but i feel as if all the keenness was knocked out of me 
if a chap can't so much as fall out of a tree on a wanderer's path at the nick of time without smashing himself what's the good of him besides i said if it hadn't been frenchy but somebody else of a different turn of mind he might have taken you at a disadvantage and jolly well killed you in real bush ranging that is what would have happened admitted freckles as it is i expect months perhaps years will have to go by before i feel to hanker after it again and meantime i shan't rest in peace till i've paid frenchy how i asked well i believe it's to be done he's often come to see me while i was on my back in bed and he's told me a lot about himself he's frightfully hard up and a roman catholic and hopes to lay his bones in la belle france with luck but he doesn't think he'll ever be able to manage it he told me all this little knowing my father was extremely rich well you see the mater wants somebody french for the kids at home which are girls and knowing frenchy bars this climate i think australia might do him good he's fifty-three years old and it seems to me if the governor rode and offered him his passage and a good screw he'd go i have made it a personal thing to myself and told the governor what a good little chap he is and what a beautiful accent he's got and the thing that happened in the wood the affair dropped then and about six weeks after when freckles was getting fit again he walked with me one half holiday to see the place where he was smashed up the bough was a frightful high one to drop from even in daylight also it was broken freckles got awfully excited when he spotted it there there he said that's the best thing i've seen for twelve weeks i don't see much to squeak about i said especially as the beastly tree nearly did for you but can't you see it's broken that's what did it i thought i slipped and if i had i shouldn't have been made of the stuff for a bush ranger but the wretched branch broke and that is jolly different that wasn't my fault the most hardened old hand must have come down then in fact he couldn't have stopped up oh what a lot of misery i'd have been saved through all these last weeks if i'd known it broke in a natural sort of way he got an awful deal of comfort out of this and said he should return to his old ways again as soon as he could run a mile without stopping and we found his lead mask like ned kelly's just where it had dropped when he had rolled over in the fern and he welcomed it like a dog that's the end except that his father did write to dunston about french and dunston not being very keen about frenchy himself seemed to think he would be just the chap for the girls of freckle's father anyway he went and he cried when he said good-bye to the school and freckles told me that when he said good-bye to him he yelled with crying and blessed him both in french and english and said that the sunny atmosphere of australia would very likely prolong his life until he had saved enough to get his bones back to france so he went and freckles went after him much sooner than he ever expected to because the keepers finally caught him in the game preserves sitting in his hole under the stream bank frizzling the leg of a pheasant which he had shot out of a tree with his air gun and buried seven days before and dunston wrote to his father and his father wrote back that freckles being now fourteen and apparently having less sense than when he left australia had better return to his native land and go into the wool business and begin life as an office boy in his place of business freckles told me that chaps in his father's office generally got a fortnight's holiday but that his mother would probably work up his governor to give him three weeks then he would get a proper outfit and track away to the boundless scrub and fall in with other chaps who had similar ideas and began to take life seriously he said i might see his name in australian newspapers in about a year but he never wrote to me and i don't know if he really succeeded well i'm sure i hope he did for he was a tidy chap though queer End of story three. Story four of The Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four concerning Corky Minimus. One. If Corky Minor had been at school that term, the thing would never have come about. 
but corky minor was always one of the lucky chaps and just when in the ordinary course of events he would have had to begin fagging for an exam something happened to his right lung and he had to go on an awful fine trip to australia in a sailing ship that left corky major who was a mere learning machine in the sixth and corky minimus who was ten and in the lower fourth it began like this after bray had licked derbyshire and bethune which he did one after the other on the same half holiday chaps gave him best as a matter of course and he became cock of the lower school he was solid muscle all through and harder than stone and he had a brother in london who was runner-up in the amateur lightweight championship two years following bray fancied himself a bit naturally and was always roaming about seeking fellows to punch but once out of bounds in a private wood a keeper caught him and licked him which was seen by two other fellows and remembered against bray afterwards when he put on too much side he and corky minimus were in the same class because bray though thirteen didn't know much at first they were great chums and bray bossed corky and palled with him and when brown the under mathematical master told corky minimus that he was the least of all the corkies and not worthy to be called a corky because he couldn't do rule of three or some rot bray said a thing that brown overheard and got sent up but by degrees the friendship of bray and corky minimus cooled off and the matter of milly settled it the doctor had four daughters and milly was the youngest mabel and ethel held no dealings with any fellows under the sixth and mary had something wrong with her spine and didn't count but i never cared for any of them myself because you couldn't tell what they meant beatrice for instance was absolutely engaged to morris for he told his sister so in the holidays and his sister told morris minor and he told me the next term morris was the head of the school and he had her photograph fixed into a foreign nut which he wore on his watch-chain but when he left and she found out he was gone into a bank at eighty pounds a year she dropped him like a spider mind you morris had told her he was descended on his mother's side from a race of old irish kings which may have unsettled her anyway when she found he came on his father's side from a race of church curates she wrote and said it was off but there were other things that upset the chumming of bray and corky minimus before the milly row and they ought to be taken in turn first there was the old testament prize which was the only thing bray had the ghost of a chance of getting but corky beat him by twenty-three marks and bray said afterwards that corky had cribbed a lot of stuff about joshua and corky said he hadn't and even declared he knew as much about joshua as bray and a bit over then on top of that came the match with neckties which was rather a rum match in its way both of them used to be awfully swagger about their neckties and each fancied his own so one bet the other half a crown he would wear a different necktie every day for a month the month being june that meant thirty different neckties each and the chap who wore the best neckties would win a fellow called fowl was judge being the son of an artist and neither bray nor corky was allowed to buy a single new tie or add to the stock he had in his box at the end of a fortnight they stood about equal though corky's ties were rather more artistic than bray's which were chiefly yellow and spotted but then came an awful falling away and some of the affairs they wore were simply weird the test for these was if the tie passed in class then the terms of the match were altered and they decided to go on wearing different things till one or other was stopped by a master any concern not noticed was considered a necktie in the ordinary acceptation of that term as fowl put it at the end of the third week corky minimus came out in an umbrella cover done in a sailor's knot but nobody worth mentioning spotted it and the next day bray wore a bit of blue ribbon off a chocolate box which also passed they struggled on this sort of a way till bray got bowled over i think corky was wearing a yard measure dipped in red ink that morning but it looked rather swagger than not class was not ended when old briggs of all people a man who wore two pairs of spectacles at one time very often said to bray what is that around your neck boy and bray said my tie sir 
then briggs said is it sir let me see it please i have noticed an increasing disorder about your neck arrangements for a week past you insult me and you insult the class by appearing here in these ridiculous ties it shan't happen again sir said bray trying to edge out of the classroom no bray it shall not said old briggs bring me that thing at once please bray handed it up and briggs examined it as if it was a botanical specimen or something this he announced is not a necktie at all you're wearing a piece of brussels carpet wretched boy a fragment of the new carpet laid down yesterday in the doctor's study you will kindly take it to him immediately say who sent you and state the purpose to which you were putting it so bray by the terms of the match lost and corky minimus won with the yard measure then the feeling between them grew especially after bray said that he could only pay his half-crown in installments of a penny a week now we come to milly you see she was corky minor's great pal the term before but now that he was at sea and thousands of miles off she chucked him and turned to corky minimus that shows what she was really anyway in a bad moment for young corky she told him he had eyes like an eagle's and it simply turned his head as an eagle's eyes are yellow i couldn't see myself what there was to be so jolly pleased about but he was and to show you what a chap may come to if a girl collars him i know for a fact that corky minimus tried to paint a picture for her whether he actually succeeded i cannot say but he went down four places in class and got awfully dropped on by brown then came that attempt of bray to cut corky out and being myself a tremendous personal chum of corky's i wished he had succeeded but he didn't and even his fighting didn't take milly after a month of giving her things to eat and so on he said it was his red hair that stood between them and told fowl he didn't care a straw about her but from the way he went on to corky minimus any fool could see he really cared a lot the chap called fowl comes in here this obscene fowl as we called him out of virgil being really a term in a crib applied to harpies though he would have run if a mouse had squeaked at him was yet responsible for more fights than any fellow in the school he sneaked about asking chaps if they gave one another best and when at last he found two who didn't funk each other though they might be perfectly good friends he never rested until there was a fight he got kicked sometimes but not enough that was owing to the fact that his hampers from home were most extraordinary they came on roman feast days because he was a roman catholic by religion and some fellows even said that the more you kicked fowl the more you were likely to get from the hampers that was rot of course and a jolly suspicious thing happened once Nunes, a chap in the lower fifth kicked fowl the very morning before a hamper came and that same evening after prayers fowl gave Nunes about half a whacking big melon and the next day Nunes jolly near died fowl swore he hadn't put anything in the melon but it was bosh to say that half a melon if it's all right is going to do a chap any harm anyway we rather funked fowl's hampers afterwards well this wretched obscene fowl met me one day licking his fat lips and showing great excitement so i knew he'd probably worked up a fight but it wasn't that though something worse he said where's corky minimus bray wants him what for i said i may mention that i am called mckins as a matter of fact he's heard something and he says though he's sorry he's got to lick corky fowl smacked his beastly mouth as if he'd got pineapple drops in it what's corky done i said it's about milly dunstan young corky talks jolly big with her and doesn't even speak civil of his friends by quite an accident i was passing through the shrubbery from brown's house to the chapel yesterday and i went by the summer-house which is out of bounds and couldn't help overhearing milly and corky minimus who were there and corky distinctly said that bray was as fiery as his hair and that he had no more control of himself than a burning mountain and milly laughed and you sneaked off and told bray as his chum i had to ah then i shall tell corky what you heard being his chum 
i shouldn't said fowle it's only making mischief besides bray won't take an apology now he says he's stood all that flesh and blood can stand those were his very words in fact i'm looking for corky minimus at this moment to tell him that bray wants him up in the gym to lick him fowle smacked his lips again he's brought it on himself well i said i'll give the message you can go back and tell bray you've told me i'd rather have done it myself said fowle regretfully as though he was being robbed of tuck well you won't i answered him being pretty sick with the worm of a chap by that time you go back and say that corky will turn up in ten minutes then he cleared out reluctantly leaving this tremendous responsibility entirely on my hands two i went off there and then for corky it's a bit of a jar for a chap to get a message like that unexpectedly and i didn't know what advice to give corky major was no good if i told him he would have blinked through his goggles and have said some bosh very likely in latin and corky minor being thousands of miles away it looked blue because you can't ask anybody but a chap's own brothers to take up a matter like this i couldn't lick bray myself or i would have the next minute i met corky himself and from an awful rum look about him i thought for a moment he'd had the licking already but he hadn't and before i could speak he said mckins i've got to fight bray my dear chap you couldn't i began i know he answered but i've got to things have happened listen to this i've just left milly and she's in a frightful bait i shouldn't have thought a girl could have got in such a rage without hurting herself bray told fowle that there were as good fish in the sea as ever came out of it meaning milly and fowle wrote it on a bit of paper and dropped it where milly was bound to see it he didn't put his name but she knows his writing now she's pretty well mad and said it's a disgrace that a thick-necked speckly stumpy chap like bray should be cock of the lower school well i said very likely it was but i didn't see how it could be helped him being such a fighter then she tossed her hair about and said i won't have anything more to do with the lower school at all while he's cock of it of course i didn't think she included me being well her greatest pal alive since corky minor went so i said quite right i shouldn't look at them then she turned round rather suddenly and said i was included so i said i should be only too glad to fight him if there was a ghost of a chance but there isn't it's no good pretending he's four inches taller and miles more round the chest and round the arms and ages older in fact he could lick me with one hand tied behind him then she said the days of chivalry are dead which she'd got out of a book of course and she added that she was tired of all boys and that a chap with eyes like mine ought to have more devil in him yes she used that word i said what do you want me to do and she said oh nothing i wouldn't have a hair of your head singed for the world only i thought that it might interest you more than other people to know i'd been insulted of course if it's nothing to you then she stopped and marched away and i went after her and asked her to explain and she answered that the explanation ought to come from me she said do you ever read dragon stories and i said yes then she went on well in all the ones i've read if a lady asked anybody to kill a dragon the person didn't say that the dragon could beat him with one paw tied behind it even though he thought so but he jolly well went and did the best he could naturally after that i saw what she meant and i said oh all right milly of course if you've been insulted i must make the beggar apologize or try to yes she said cheering up like anything you are my own precious champion and i love you i tell you all this because you're my chum and you'll have to be my second and if i can even black his eye before he settles me it will be something well i call it a shoes i said she might as well have asked you to fight blanchard or sims look at your arms not to mention anything else they're like cabbage stalks yes i know all that said corky minimus and it'll be rather rotten for her if he kills me but the thing's got to be done and the sooner it's over the better then i suddenly remembered bray's message and told corky he seemed surprised he can't lick me on the spot if i challenge him to fight in a regular way can he he asked but rather doubtfully i said it seemed to me he couldn't 
then we went up to the gym where bray was talking to about four chaps including fowl oh you've come you kid have you you'd better not keep me waiting another time when i send for you he began now i'm going to lick you for cheek what cheek corky minimus said fowl heard you say i was as fiery as my hair oh fowl he hears a lot i know did you say it or didn't you yes i did and i say it again and you're a dirty bully too bray came quite close to corky minimus and put his face so near that their noses were almost touching like cats do when they're going to have a row on a wall say that once more if it isn't troubling you too much said bray i'll say it as often as you like answered young corky keeping his eye on bray's and i'll say another thing too which is that before you talk so big about me being a kid and licking me you'd better find out first if i give you best golly said bray grinning like mad don't you no i don't and i'll fight you properly with seconds the first minute we can corky minimus had certainly come out of it fine so far and i only wished he could fight as well as he talked of course from bray's point of view it was the best thing that could have happened because now he had a right to lick corky and a right to lick him as badly as he could the bell rang a minute afterwards and going in it was settled the fight should come off next wednesday that being a half holiday part of merivale woods skirted the cricket field and as the second eleven to which bray belonged wasn't playing a match everything suited very comfortably blanchard the cock of the school agreed to umpire and he and another chap in the fifth very kindly promised to carry young corky home by a secluded way if he was too much smashed to walk fowl seconded bray and i saw bray teaching him how to fan with a towel and spurt water over a fellow's face between the rounds of course it was about as good fun as killing rats with a stick for bray three corky minimus saw milly once or twice before the fight and he said he couldn't make out whether she was going mad or what one minute she wanted him to fight and the next she implored him not to one minute she hoped he would mutilate bray to pieces the next she blubbed and prayed him if ever he had any liking for her to give bray best she said she kept dreaming of him brought back stark and stiff and then when he began to think she meant it she called him her knight and her hero and her king arthur and other frightful rot and actually wanted him to wear one of her sunday gloves under his shirt at the time of fighting corky minimus said he very likely wouldn't wear a shirt and then she thought he might hang it i mean the glove round his neck by a bit of string blessed if i shall ever feel quite the same to her after this said corky it seems rather rough to get broken up for life to please a skimpy girl i said then he burst out as red in the face as an apple and told me he would not hear a word against milly so i dried up there were three days before the fight and corky minimus trained for it and gave away his pudding at dinner in exchange for the meat of the chaps who sat next to him but you can't get your muscle up in a day or two like that and it only made him awfully thirsty the day came at last and i may as well go on to the fight itself the first were having a big match on our own ground so nobody paid any attention to us and we arranged a game that should have corky bray and me on the same side then when our chaps were in we three sneaked away into the plantations behind some holly trees and a wood stack bray arranged all the preliminaries as cheerful as a bird and blanchard said they were right they marked out a ring and ran a string round and arranged corners for the seconds i saw that the obscene fowl had towels and bottles of water and a basin all of course for bray between the rounds corky minimus was rather waxy with me for not bringing the same for him but i'd brought a sponge which i know is a thing a second chucks up in the air when his man is done for and i explained and showed it to corky and he thanked me and said he supposed that was about the only thing he should want blanchard said the rounds were to be two minutes long each and bray grumbled because they ought by rights to be three but blanchard told him to shut up and begin when he saw bray take his shirt off i told corky he ought to and he did then blanchard laughed and said 
by gum they peel rather different bray was like a barrel with muscles a lot bigger than hen's eggs on his arms corky minimus seemed to be all ribs somehow with arms about as lean as rulers i told him to keep moving about and try and puff bray a bit if he had time and he said all right i'll try if i can get a smack at his face so as to black an eye or something and show i've hit him before he does for me i don't care i will say for corky minimus that he had about the best pluck i ever saw in a chap he was quite calm and just his usual colour and when bray tossed him for corners corky won and blanchard said i picked the right corner for him then he told them to fight fair and said time i deprayed corky to try and surprise bray at the very start if he could and have a hit at bray's face the moment they began and i'm blessed if he didn't go and do it bray began fiddling about jolly scientifically with his hands and i fancy he just squinted down to see if his feet were scientific too at the same moment corky buzzed around his right and let bray have it fairly on the nose bray jumped and looked about as much surprised as if he'd been struck by lightning and blanchard said first blood for corky minimus i yelled i oughtn't to have but i did because to see blood dropping about on bray's chest was a fine sight he sniffed and went for corky smiling the smile was the beastliest part of it for i hoped he would have got his wool off a bit and been wild but he wasn't and when he began to hit corky got flustered and swung about like a windmill and caught it pretty hot yet he jerked his head so jolly quick that he didn't get more than about four smacks on it in the first round though his body which was white by nature was pretty soon covered with red marks he said they didn't hurt and i cleaned him up and blew water over him at the end of the round his lip was bleeding like mad but luckily inside where his tooth had cut it and he swallowed all the blood so nobody knew besides which the blood wasn't lost bray flung himself down in his corner and fowl looked after him and even at a solemn time like that i laughed and so did corky minimus because fowl tried to be too clever and spurted a lot of water out of his mouth into bray's eye then bray told him that after the fight he'd tie him in knots and kick him looking forward to which of course wrecked fowl's enjoyment entirely blanchard said time again awfully soon and i saw bray meant settling corky now because his reputation as a fighter was at stake and he knew corky hoped to get through three rounds with luck so bray began hitting him like hammers and though i was about as sorry for corky minimus as a chap could be nobody would have been able to help admiring the way bray hit it was just at the end of this round when corky had been knocked down once but got up again that the awful rum thing with milly dunstan happened suddenly without any warning there was a noise like fowls getting up a hedge and she rushed out from behind the woodstack with her eyes blazing and her hair streaming like a comet in a bait she'd been running a good way i should think and she tore right into the ring straight at bray and not trusting to words at a time like that and not remembering her father was a clergyman or anything slapped his face both sides and jolly hard too bray swore the horriblest words i ever heard used by a chap because she'd given him more in half a second than corky could have in a year then he got into his shirt upside down and hooked it with fowl but not before he heard her say you little fat red-headed coward to fight and try and murder a boy half your age and size i wish i could kill you i do it's shameful to think you're an english boy at all then she turned on the chaps from the fifth and told blanchard he was a disgrace to the school so they cleared out too and then she cried over corky and said she would rather have been torn to pieces by unchained monsters than have let him be mangled like he was and corky who was pretty well dazed forgave her and told her kindly to go away and she gasped and gurgled and went i took corky back and one or two things got to be known it came out that fowl had told milly the place and the hour of the fight but only after she had sworn on some rotten saint fowl knew that she would not tell a single soul about it she kept her swear all right but came herself 
and when bray got to hear how it was she came of course thinking corky had told her which he would rather have died than do then bray tried a lot of chinese tortures on fowl that he'd seen at a waxworks and chaps who saw it said that fowl was so excited at the time that he called upon about twenty different well-known bible characters by name to come and help him and destroy bray but they didn't as for corky minimus the things he got from milly after that fight you wouldn't believe there were bottles of stuff to rub bruises with and lozenges and grapes and some muck for his eye and little baskets of strawberries and jolly books and rosebuds she told the doctor about slapping bray's face and wrote a long letter of apology afterwards and a week later she broke it to corky minimus that she was going to a boarding school herself next term which she did when corky told me about it he added and she's going to write me letters because she said several times that there's only one chap in the world for her now and i'm the chap i shouldn't think she could change her mind after all that's happened i said and corky minimus said i bet she will when corky minor turns up again especially if he brings rum things with him from australia and you needn't repeat it but to you mckins as my chum i say that i don't care how soon he does come back either which showed that there was more sense in corky minimus than you might have thought End of story four.